Matthew 16 and 24, then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Well, as far as invitations go, that's not too inviting. See, when you get an invitation or we get an invitation, if, I'm not going to have them put it up, but that not light the night, that's pretty inviting. I want to come to that. Looks like fun. Looks like fun for me. Looks like I might get something. Jesus' invitation isn't of that nature, Sister Peaches. It's not. It's come follow me. You're going to deny yourself. See, I'll be honest, I'm not trying to sugarcoat church. Now, you can go down the street and find someone to tell you, you don't have to do nothing. We're just going to keep beating Jesus and cause him to keep bleeding and suffering, and we're just going to keep on sinning. You can find that. I make you feel real comfortable. You don't you know, but Jesus is honest. Because if you really want me, you'll... You ever hear someone, oh, man, I can't believe the church asked me to do this and the church asked me to do that. Well... You know what? We didn't ask you to deny yourself. Jesus did. Am I in your living room yet? Well, I'm trying to get out of it and let Jesus get in there. If you're, if you're willing today, he's got something fantastically amazing for you to do. But if you're so busy looking for an invitation to a party, you come to the wrong room. You see, the invitation is to give you an invitation to get people to the greatest party that will ever be held. Let's set our Bibles down and let's, let's talk to Jesus for a minute. Jesus, we need you today. We use words like I'm a believer and I love Jesus and I'm a follower, and I'm a Christian. God, we need to make sure we meet with you today because I don't want anybody to come and leave today unchanged. Somehow, Lord, help us to understand and lay aside our, our ego and our arrogance and, and grasp of Christian humility to realize I need to meet you today, Jesus, in a special life-changing way. And all those that are with me in that, say in Jesus' name. God bless you. Let's give the Lord a hand. Praise as we're seated. Amen. Amen. I, I told our, you can be seated. I told our staff this morning in our meeting, I said, you know, I really don't know how this is going to go today. I've been so burdened, I couldn't finish it. It's kind of open-ended, and it's kind of got to, uh, multi-directions that I can go. So I'm not, not, I'm not sure. So I kind of feel like he said, get in the car, start it, just start driving, and I'm going to give you directions as we go. Now, see, that's easy to say, but I don't take directions well like that. If you've ever ridden with me under those conditions, I'll let you know if I, you tell me before I got to turn. So Jesus chose 12 men as he began his earthly ministry he chose 12 disciples followers apostles men Peter and Andrew James and John and Matthew Thaddeus Thomas Bartholomew Philip Simon the Canaanite James the son of Alphaeus one we all know, Judas Iscariot. <laughs> he had an invitation that he used. He had a phrase that he used. It. And he used it regularly. In, in Matthew 19, a young man came to him and he, he wanted the stamp of approval. 
Look, I hate to break it to you. I'd like God's stamp of approval. I'm not against the premise behind the man. But if you're going to meet Jesus and you're going to ask Jesus direct questions, I don't think you need to get all sideways when he gives you a direct answer. I, I got people that come to me, hey, pastor, tell me what. You, you really don't want me to. The reason you're coming and saying that is because you're already struggling. Well, I don't be to hurt your feeling. Feelings really ain't got nothing to do with it. Facts do. And so the man can't give me the facts. Can we paraphrase that? Give me the facts, Lord. Tell me what I lack. You know you've got to be bad. I mean, you've got to have Christianity. You got it. You got to know it. You're going to walk up to Jesus like, come on. Lay it on me. Because I think I got this. And Jesus said, okay, if you're going to be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor. You want to be like me? <laughs> See, we all want to be like Jesus till it cost us. I want the power and the authority. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come and here he says it, follow me. This young man met Jesus. Wow, he met Jesus. But when the young man heard that saying, how many Jesus sayings get you to do like this young man? You go away sorrowful. Because whatever it is that you wanted to retain was great to you. Luke 9 and 23, he said to them all, all. See, it's not just the disciple thing. It's not just a pastoral thing. It's not just a ministry thing. It's an everybody thing. If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross sometimes. On weekends. When it's convenient. Is that word daily in there? Yeah. yeah. He don't mean Friday night, though. He don't mean when there's a church function going on. Daily. And there he uses it again. And follow me. In fact, doing the will of God the condition of doing the will of God over anything else is paramount when you follow Jesus. Because the instant, and we're given one, that it's okay to do anything else is met with a sharp rebuke. How many of us have heard it with, maybe from our own selves or from a buddy or a friend, the moment you want to stop and do something great, forgot, oh, wait a minute now. Hold on. It's Monday morning now. That was Sunday. Yeah. Or are you going to give a commitment and your, 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 your spouse, oh, man, come on. I didn't agree to that. But the instant anything less was suggested in Matthew 16, Jesus says from that time forward, Jesus began to show his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer. suffer. What? What? Suffer many things of the elders, the chief priests, the sky. And he's talking about church folks. <laughs> oh, y'all in trouble. I'm only preaching once today. We good. <laughs> and be killed. See, we all want to serve Jesus, but we don't want to die. You want to serve Jesus, but you still want to make sure it's all you. I'm going to do something now, but no, it's me because I want my accolade. I, 
they got to know it's me. Right? And be raised the third day. Peter took him. Hold up, Jesus. Let me fix you here, man, because you're talking about stuff. No, we're not down with that. Hold on. The Bible says he took Jesus. He, how many of us take Jesus where he don't want to go? Man, I'm not even out of my text yet. We're in trouble today. What time? <laughs> Took him and began to rebuke him. Oh, now, I don't know about you. That, that's, that's strong. <laughs> Saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. That natural human proclivity towards self-preservation is instantly squashed in this setting. We're a little more lenient today because, well, Jesus is here in the spirit and he's not walking up down actually sitting with you and going to your house today in a realm where he can look right at you and you get to see his eyes. Be in his presence and hear his words. But he completely annihilated the concept of anything less than following him. And so when he when he heard that from Peter, because Peter took him, he took him so much that it says that Jesus, when he turned around, in other words, he had to turn back around. He had to, and he wanted to look at all the disciples. So he's making this clear. He looked on his disciples and he rebuked Peter, saying, get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus met Peter's guns with bigger guns. <laughs> Can I say it that way? Okay, hot shot. Okay, I got you. I, I feel you. <laughs> you know, you came to... You came with a knife to a gunfight. <laughs> and he makes the statement, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest. Can we be honest about what we savor? Yes. Not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Look, can we be real? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. C -c -c man, if, if I... You know, it's prayer Monday and Tuesday. We're going to find out what you savor. There's a meeting tonight with a whole bunch of fun. I'm a, We'll see what you bring. See how all in you are, what you savor. Your neighbors know what you savor because you ain't never knocked on their door. Your co-workers, your wife, your husband. And when he had called, he said, come here. Let me, I just dealt with this joker rebuking me. Let me tell you something. And he called unto him all the people with his disciples. Let me tell you something. You need to get this. This is Jesus in a hot moment. This, look, I know we like flowery sermons that get us running and shouting, and I got the victory. I ain't done nothing, but I got the victory. And you ain't had the victory in so long. You still got the same addictions, the same foul mouth, the same attitude. You ain't changed a bit in years. You got the same habits and hobbies. You are the same person because what you really savor. Now, we don't like this kind of preaching because you're at, we're, we're, he's asking us to change. But can I tell you from the very beginning, he never hid that. The world made that garbage up. <laughs> He's going to accept me as I am. He accepted everybody as they were, but he never left anybody the way they were. Listen. And he said unto all the people and his disciples, he said, whosoever will come after me. You know, he wouldn't put this in there again. Let him deny himself. Oh, wait, what? What? What's this new phrase? Take up his cross. Wait a minute. That's an implement of death in that era. 
Oh, see, it's not an implement of death today. It's something you wear around your neck, a little cross. You put it on your car. You put it on the wall. See, it's art today. We have made everything about serving God. Flowery and comfortable and all about for me instead of me denying myself. This ain't a, this, this is not a kind of invitation you're thinking of. I thought we was going to party and get down, Jesus. No, I'm here to stop you from going down. Take up his cross, and here it is again. Follow me. Now, before we get all high and mighty, super spiritual, these were ordinary men. These guys were not something different than you and I. They were made out of the same stuff. They probably had hair growing out of their ears as they got older, too. <laughs> Can I get a witness? They probably had to change waist size as they got older too. They got to deal with just the nastiness about their flesh just like we did. Ordinary men, fishermen, tax collectors. <laughs> you radicals and zealots. They were common men. Most were not highly educated men. They were hardworking. I think, I think that's something Jesus liked. They were a unique assortment of people from varying backgrounds. These men, these men out of nowhere, from an invitation to follow to deny, followed him for three, over three years. They witnessed and saw so many things that Jesus said and did. Twelve men. Of ordinary men, and somehow we've got to believe that as, as ordinary as they were and we are, he saw something in them that he approved of. Oh, had they arrived? No, they were just starting out, but he approved of where they were at in order to start the mission. Oh, somebody get with me today. He saw something he could use. He looked and saw beyond their social standing, beyond just their simple abilities in the world's marketplace. He saw beyond their past successes and failures in every avenue of their walk of life. He saw past their limitations and deficiencies. I would dare say, where we struggle, he looked beyond their liabilities. We're careful who we get involved in. But if you look around the room, I guess Jesus isn't. That kind of went over some heads. You might get that one tomorrow. He saw potential. Not perfection. He saw future glory not past failure. Leaders in the rough. Disciples in the raw clay of humanity. Unformed. Unfinished. Let me say this to you right here. Let me get you off the hook. I've been doing this every week. Quit acting like you're finished. Quit acting like you're some polished work of art that God needs to take and set up in the curio all for us to sit back and look at in awe. Ain't no one like that here. Oh, well, hello? Uh, well. These, like us, were unhewn stone that the master wants to get to see. They were an unpainted canvas, untapped potential. Not much to think of when you want to start the greatest movement that will ever hit mankind. But the difference was, is these ordinary men met Jesus. 
Jesus saw what no one else would ever see. Michelangelo made the statement, the sculpture is already complete within the marble block before I ever start my work. It's already there. I just have to chisel away the material that is not a part of the finished product. Jesus still does this today. And he's still doing it right now. You sit here today unfinished. But if you let the master's hands uh, reach into your life, he, he's going to keep chiseling at an amazing, beautiful sculpture of a life. If you let him, will start to appear. We are to be sculpted by the hands of God, his word, his will. In fact, this concept's not lost. The prophet Jeremiah brings the same demonstration in God's ability to make masterpieces of ordinary people. He, he told Jeremiah, down to the potter's house, watch. And the Bible says the potter wrought a work on the wheels. And I don't believe it's a coincidence that as he was working it, the, the vessel was marred in the hands of the potter. He made it again another vessel. And what's lost in that is he didn't change the clay. Give, give me that same clay. Give me that same person that y'all think is messed up. Give it to, watch what I. If you want to stop struggling in the same thing, you better get your life back in hand. He can fix it. He can fix it. If you've been stuck, if you've been stagnant, if you've been stalled out, if you'll release up, if you'll meet Jesus today, again, and put your life in it, I'm telling you, he can form and fashion something that none of us, or even you, will, oh, he can bring up an amazing vessel up out of this place today, and you'll put your life back in his hands. If you'll say, you know what, Jesus, I'm tired of being everything to all this stuff. I'm going to give up all this stuff so that I can be in your hands. I don't want to be enamored by stuff. I want to be enamored by a Savior that can make me the right stuff. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, if you'll be moldable clay today, there's no limits. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, where you've been, what you've done. If you will put your clay back in the master's hands, he can make it again another vessel. We don't get do-overs, but God does. Hallelujah. See, when you won't deny yourself to be in his hands, I hope you can enjoy what you can do for yourself. And I hope it's enough for you for all eternity. Because that's all you're going to get. But if you'll release yourself into the hands of Jesus... That thing that you thought, I'd never get there. You could if you let Jesus get you there. The only difference between those that do good things for God and those who do great things for God is how much you release yourself into the hands of God. Well, why is he anointed to do that? He ain't nothing. Well, none of us are. He just, said, he just lets himself into the hands of God a little bit more than you. Why, why would God use you? Because you put yourself in his hands to be you. Why ain't God using me to reach souls? Well, put your hand, life in his hands to get you. Why ain't my family like this? Put yourself in his hands to get you. That way. My God, he's looking around for someone whose life he... I, I hear all I know God will give me an opportunity. Opportunity to what? I want to do something. Well, the first thing you need to do is get yourself back in the hands of Jesus. Well, if we'll be moldable clay in his hands, he can do anything with us. You see, the problem is we get older, we think we see everything. We 
think we know everything. But you have to understand, we're doing that compared to the joker sitting next to us. Big whoop. He sees the end from the beginning. Wait a minute, I'm tired of thinking, I'm doing pretty good because I'm better than you. Wait a minute. How can you get God wants if you're satisfied with just being better than the person sitting next to you? See, God sees what we cannot see. In fact, he sees what no one else can see. And then you add to that, he can do what no one else can do. Oh, Lord, how long? Oh, he is in the business of transformation. Oh. I just can't imagine what would happen if someone would meet Jesus today and say, I'm all in. You see, because he's in the business of transformation, the defects do not disqualify those whom Jesus can work on. Jesus is not limited by your past failures. You see, there's a story when he, in Mark 5, he's come out of the ship. Immediately he was met by a, a man that had an unclean spirit. Look, the dude lived in the graveyard, so it's pretty good indication all them dogs weren't barking in his kennel. But you add to that, he was strong. All the dogs aren't barking strong. Sounds like some people I know. Yeah, you're strong. Stubborn looks like strength. Arrogance looks like strength. Yeah, come on. It's the truth. Come on. Come on. Rudeness looks like strength. Yeah. No man could bind him. No, not with chains. Look, it's a, it's a sad day if your brother or your sister can't have influence and help you. If the, the Lord tells us in his word, iron sharpeneth iron. Look, if you can't get help from the person, say, look, if I can't, if I, I as pastor can't help you, where are you really at? If, the, if, you, if you came here today and this preaching doesn't change you, you're in trouble. If you don't think you need improvement, oh, Lord, you know what? Let's just get your casket and get it over with. You're done. <laughs> this, oh, this, 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 this case, no one could deal with him. No one could tame him, it said. Night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when Jesus, it says, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him. You're telling me you can't run up and worship God. You can't get beside yourself. And this man who had a legion, I'm going to say this. If you can't worship while someone else is preaching, don't expect them to get behind you when you are. Right. If you can't get up and, and say, you know what, thank God someone's up there putting out that effort. Amen. Can I tell you, I'm going to be here for prayer whether I'm preaching or not. Amen. Amen. Some of you well, you, you gotta get, we can all tell it's your turn. <laughs> Why? Because it's not a daily consistent thing. Look, I'm not trying to point finger. I'm trying to help. Wait a minute. I, I want this to be daily. A daily denial so that I could be, make me, Lord. Well, his very first interaction with disciples said, come and follow me and I will make. There's some of us, we ain't going to be made to do nothing. And we don't realize, now you know why you are where you are. Because sometimes God's going to use another person, another man, another, to make you or it will break you. Now, let me get into some nitty-gritty here real quick. I need to hurry up. So we know that Jesus, we know the story of this man and how Jesus cast the 
demons out of him, and they ran into the pigs. And, and you know, one, one, one story goes that they never should have had them pigs. It was kind of a, it was kind of a little secret, little money-making scheme. <laughs> we ain't got none of that going on around here. We don't. And so all of a sudden, the, 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 the townsfolk who had to deal with this joker were upset. Wait a minute. And so the Bible says they came out. They're, gonna come, they're, gonna, they're coming to meet Jesus. <laughs> and when they come to meet Jesus, they saw him that was, isn't no longer, was, possessed with the devil and had a legion. Legion. But this time he's sitting and clothed and in his right mind. You know what it says they were when they saw this man healed and getting his life back together? They were afraid. You know what they'd lost? Control. What stops some people from getting in God with Kenny, you always have to be in control. That's right. Come on, preach it, Pastor. You know, in our meeting, in our meeting this morning. Now look. I don't play games. Y'all know me. I'm pretty serious. I don't play games. We got we got men doing stuff around here. We got ladies doing stuff around here. I'm not I'm not a control freak. But ain't gonna be no Disneyland around here. You start that Mickey Mouse stuff, I'll pull you up short. But you are free to do in the will of God, in the spirit of God. I'm I I'm not gonna run around like this with my thumb on everybody. Look, I hope you got enough Holy Ghost to do what's right. I've had people, hey, pastor, it's okay to pray for people? Oh, are you out of your mind? Pray for them. When I, when I call people to anoint them with oil, I want our elders to come pray with you. I, look, this is a church. You are free. But the thing is, 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 is uh, don't just be spiritual on Sunday. See, because I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to interject this right now. Not everybody wants you to be healed. Not everybody wants a move of God. You need to hear me now. I'm dealing with some spiritual stuff right now. I'm dealing with it. Not everyone wants you delivered from your disease or your dysfunction. You might even have family that profits emotionally, socially, or financially from your failures or shortcomings. Man, I like you being a drug addict so I can get my score for free. I like the fact that you got that proclivity because that means I'm justified in having mine. That's why you hang around who you hang around. You come over to pastor's house, you ain't going to be acting the fool. So that's why, hey, I, I ain't banging down his door. But I got that joker down the street that my own family don't know about. I got this person in my black book. I'm real comfortable with them. I got my buddies. See, because I get around past man, that pastor always always trying to call me to be better and to do better and to improve. What's this improvement stuff? I'm tired of improvement. I'm gonna do something for me. <laughs> right? Me, man. My Friday night, I'm gonna go out and do something. Sit at Olive Garden, sit and talk, talk about yeah, church. <laughs> I'm gonna go out and fool around. I don't want to go out and get someone a Bible study. I want to go feed me. Well, well, we're because we're really not going to be churchy, really, are we? We just do this thing on Sunday. No. See, there are people that spirit you don't even realize in the evil spirit side of things. They want a lord over you. You better hear me. They like the fact that you got that little dependency. They like you right there. They, they okay, that's where I like you. I'll tell you just enough to make you think I love you. But I got an ulterior motive because, hey, keeping you down makes me feel lifted up. Oh, man, I, hey, I, I know I'm touching a spiritual nerve here. What? Let me tell you, sir. What, you think you don't think that spirit works in your children when they go off to school or around another group? They come on, you feel that little, your kids stand up to you like, well, where do you think that came from? You've been loving them and feeding them and taking care of them. All of a sudden, you're the enemy? Oh, the devil is a lot. How is it that you run all day long, all week long, around out there, and then you want to walk in there, Pastor ain't using me. Wait, wait a minute. 
Are you being used to God out there before you ever show up here? Are you living a life out there that God? Look, if, man, you tell you 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 you're preaching hellfire and brimstone out there. Okay, bring them in here, but it's yours. Preach, baptize them, reach them, pray for them. You have to understand. There's some family members. They'll they'll degrade church. They'll degrade improvement. They'll degrade because. They don't want you cutting ties with your addictions and those proclivities and habits. They get upset when you start becoming an overcomer in your life. They, they can't wait, wait, wait. They, they're getting ahead of me. They're doing stuff. I, I, I didn't do that. They gave up things I won't give up. And you start changing the social and spiritual order like those town folks. He just took our, that guy was watching them pigs for us. He was healed. Now what are we going to do? You shouldn't have had that in the first place, you bunch of carnal folks get upset when you get spiritual. Watch. For those of you paying attention, it's been happening. It happened about three times in here already. They can't handle being around the spirit of God, the preaching and the word of God. They got to keep getting up and leaving. You have to understand what you're dealing with. And it ain't just here. It's just okay to be at home. The problem is you got to take this home. Yes, yes, yes. So after Jesus healed this man, do you know what those folks did? They began to pray him to depart out of their coast. But we don't want that Jesus thing around here. Not everyone wants Jesus doing his thing. Not everyone wants you healed. Not everyone wants you delivered. In fact, in Acts 16, 16, there was a, there was a, a girl that this damsel that calls her possessed with a spirit of divination. And she's following Paul and she cried saying, these men are the servants of the most high God, which show unto us the way of salvation. What she's saying is true, but her spirit's wrong. Oh yeah, that little church over there. People do get delivered here. You dog, you dog, you, you're dogging it because you didn't when you were here. Oh, 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 wait a second now. Oh, hold on a minute. <laughs> Paul got so grieved, he turned around and rebuked her. You talking right, but your spirit's wrong. You talk about Jesus around everybody, but we know you don't really want him to deliver people. You don't really want him to heal people. You got your issues. You, you got those things you never overcame, and you don't want no one else to get delivered, and you don't want that. To really be real, because then you're indicted. Jesus has still come to set the captives free. He has still come to remit sin. He is, if you'll meet him, you will be changed. The Bible says that when her master saw that their gain was lost. In fact, this is the hope of their gains. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrate saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. Ain't it time we start doing that? Yes. See, some of you so busy want the status quo in your house that you'll let the evil spirits win over God's spirit. Not everybody, not everybody wants you to have a godly life. Not, not, every, not everyone wants you to have the power of God working in your life. So it's no coincidence today that most people are dependent. Okay, here we go. Never in any time in history has the human population been more dependent on chemicals. You need a you need a little this, you need a little that. You gotta suck on this, you gotta snort that, you gotta drink this. In the New Testament, the word pharmakia occurs three times. Galatians five, Revelation nine, Revelation eighteen. And each time it is translated as sorcery. But before I get into this too deep, the practice of medicine is not condemned in the New Testament by no means. In fact, there are verses that point to the positive view of the true practice of medicine. 
In fact, Mark 2, Matthew 9, and Luke 5 says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. So it denotes that sick people need a doctor. Doctors aren't wrong. Don't, don't get me wrong with what I'm about to say. In fact, Colossians 4.14 brings greetings from Luke, the physician. Why would Luke's profession as a physician be mentioned if it were viewed as inappropriate or tantamount to sorcery? So the New Testament certainly does recognize that healing can occur in other ways besides through the care of a physician. But physicians, thank God for I thank God for a physician. I, I'm, I got, I've got a great doctor. But Jesus is still presented as the quintessential healer. Both Mark and Luke tell the story about a woman who had been ill. She had been, been sick for many years, who had seen many physicians, none of whom were able to help her. Mark, Luke. This does not condemn the medical profession. Rather, it describes the desperate state of this woman. So we're not talking about real sickness and disease. Hello? That need honest medical attention. Lord knows Brother Ezekiel needed some medical attention when he was roller skates a couple months back. <laughs> but what I'm referring to is self-prescribed dependency. I'm going to preach on a concept here pretty soon. We're not going to have gates with no fences around here. You ever seen out in the field where there used to be a corral, you see the gate, and there's no fences gone. They're gone. It's just there used to be a corral there. You have to understand, living for God, isn't it? You just come in and go and, and, and live how you want. When you come in, there's fences. The Lord had a very fruitful vineyard in a, in a very fruitful hill. The first thing he did was fence it. You have to understand the fences, the, the rules, and, 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 the, and the ideology and the concept of the Bible are to protect you from things. You, you, just, you just can't allow things to walk in and out of your life. You go, hey, wait a minute now. I got a door on my house. You know, that door even has a lock. You want to come in that house? I, I got to say, okay, you can come in. In other words, it has to meet my approval. So, this self-prescribed pharmacia dependency that's going on, the I can't control myself, I need a drugstore or pharmacia mentality. On the term pharmacia is an abstract noun meaning sorcery, magic, the practice of magic arts. The concrete noun is pharmacia whose primary meaning is poison. It goes on and denotes it as a magic potion or charm to achieve a desirable objective. It's, it's not a coincidence that the society today is the most drug-dependent in history. Everyone today is pressed to be dependent on something. I can't function without unnatural chemicals or stimulant injected or put into my body. I, all the way down, I, I love my wife to death, but she really can't get going without coffee in the morning. Because we've created a dependency upon a stimulant called caffeine. Now, is caffeine a sin? I'm never going to call that a sin. Give me a Mountain Dew, brother. <laughs> but I don't need that joker every day. In fact, I try to stay away from it because I know it's not good for me. So you have to understand, just, just in society, in our children today, they've replaced the training. Because the Bible tells us to train up a child in the way it should go and discipline. Speaking to my wife, who's an educator, that if she would send out a letter to her parents to feel disciplined, I can educate. Well, let me use that here. If you'll discipline yourself, I can teach. And you'll reap the benefits. Make sense? So children today are being inundated with mind-altering stimulations and subduing medication that creates a mindset of dependencies. It's not my baby's fault he didn't get his Redland today. They need drugs. They need a pharmacist. They need pharmacia. They need a, a, a chemical dependency instead of Jesus. Because in this era, pharmaceutical companies have more faithful followers than Christ. In fact, I heard a 
a gentleman speaking about what's going on in our country today with a forced mandate of a chemical. Because you have to understand, natural immunity is better than that. But it doesn't run through the pharmaceutical companies to where they can make money. And so we become guinea pigs so pharmacia can make money. Hey, adults. See, we're adults who don't think it's the same because I've reached a certain age where, well, are you kidding me? You can't function without it. Oh, you need some recreational drugs, illicit drugs, smoking, vaping, drinking. It's a constant system bombardment of chemicals into the body to death. You can't function without this. You can't function without You got anxiety. You got stressors. And yet God tells us to be anxious for nothing. Why? Because if you'll get the Holy Ghost uh, and you'll follow the word of God and you get them spirits and you get that pharmacia, that sorcery, that poison out of your life, the enemy knows if you do that, you'll be resting and sitting at the feet of Jesus. But the pharmacia and society doesn't want you set free like that. They want everyone to depend on pharmacy. I read this morning that almost 50% of the population Adult population suffers from maladaptive signs of an addictive disorder. How can Jesus change your life if you have a drug that's controlling you? How can Jesus order your steps when you got a drug doing it? You need to understand there's a reason why they want to shove chemicals down your throat. And in your body, but they're going to cut down church right now. We want to shut that thing down. There's an enemy at work here. And I'll be honest with you, if I was playing the odds, I'd play just like, like he is. If I already know I got 50% that are going to be dependent, I'll just throw drugs at them. Then I only got 50% of the population to try to deceive. Oh, Jesus, help us. Paul dealt with this. He dealt with us getting control over what's controlling us. Anybody ever been addicted? First Corinthians tells us, know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Listen, be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters. Listen, this, you can't, there's so much idolatry around here. And you, some of you don't even know what it means but you're inundated with it. Nor adulterers, nor effeminate. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards. Now they could say crack addict back then because <laughs> it's the same thing. Anything that alters you, anything that you become dependent on, anything, oh, man, my God, man, I got to go get my drink today. I can't handle it. Oh, man, I just, oh, they take the edge right off. I'm... No revilers. We live in a world of revilers. You know, reviler is as soon as you leave here, nah, I don't believe all that. That's a reviler. I don't know if you need that. I don't nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you're washed. Washed. You're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. And by the spirit of our God, all things are lawful. He, listen, all the, it's not illegal for me. I'm an adult. But that's not expedient. And I will not be brought under the power of that word power is the word excusio. It literally means to control you. That thing, that drug that wants to control. I can't leave it out. Oh, my God, where's that? Did I leave it in the car? Did I leave it out? Where's it at? I remember when I was in that world. Oh, okay. It's all good. It's there. That comfort thing. You walk in and you've got your that little stash. Oh, okay. I feel good. Guys, how many times you go this? That wallet's there, right? It's a comforting feeling. 
Ladies, your purse? You look around and say, how, how, you know? It was a lucky strike. It was some cool. Oh, wait, wait, wait. But, but with them, back when I was my day, where'd that doobie at? Oh, it's there. You get that instant. When's the last time? Okay, Jesus is here. Those things control you. You can't, you can't even function. You get irate. You get upset. That kills you everything you need to know. That's why fasting is important. It'll reveal to you your nature. Look, it doesn't cure you. It shows you. This is, look, if I miss a meal, you're going to know it. Unless I'm fasting and I miss a meal. Y'all need to get out the way. I got to get through that drive through Look, I, I'm trying to eat right and get on a diet and stuff, but I get so hungry, I don't even care, man. Burger King, I'm coming. Two Whoppers, no onions, and a large Coke. What? Because I'm in that field. Oh, I got to oh, fix this. I'm uncomfortable. Well, y'all, y'all know I'm trying to die, but y'all a bunch of drug dealers. Let's go get a turtle. I'm trying. I'm trying. I ain't got the money to buy another suit. I better keep it trimmed. I can't. Now I'm talking about funny things, but let's be real. Some of us have got some of It's serious. I know we're playing in here a little bit about some of this, but let's be real. Some of you, you and you don't have to jump up and down and say that's me, but you know you got to depend on something that's not the will of God. And it's got control and it's infecting and it's causing a problem. And you're like, I want to get through this thing. I get it. It's okay. Because when you meet Jesus, yeah. now, well, I don't have anything like that. I'm, I'm way past that. But you've got Facebook looking for them likes. Them likes are like dropping pills. Oh, you're feeling good. I got another few likes on that post. My Instagram, oh, yeah. Well, your buddies think you're all that. You got the hands approval. That's another opiate. Trust me, ain't no one here clean. And no one in here without something you're looking for that feeds your flesh. Hey, it might even be yourself. You might look in the mirror and think you're God's gift to the planet. Yeah, Luke. Hey, they popped my bubble barely. I barely got out the womb. The nurses were calling me a little ugly, and I lived with that my whole life. No, it's all right. My mom made sure I knew that one. Hello? You struggle with whatever you struggle with, but let's be honest about struggling with it. How can you get healed if you don't think you need a physician? The great physician is here. If you want to sit there with your sickness, with your addiction, with your, you can sit there with it, but I'm looking for the one willing to come out of the tombs. Willing to step out and say, you know what, Jesus? I want to be at your feet in my right mind. I don't care who it takes off. I don't who care who gets upset when I get set free, when I get delivered, when I'm living for God and no one has control over me and Jesus can order my steps. That's freedom. That's real freedom. I'm going to say a word that almost, a phrase that almost sounds oxymoronic. Discipline is freedom. Discipline is freedom. All you undisciplined folks, you ain't got a dime to do nothing. But you disciplined folks got money in the bank. You ready to go, hey, if you want that, you can go. Hey, teenagers, those of you that were undisciplined, running around with all them extra kids. Oh, well, you can't go. You got to stay home and watch them kids. But if you'd have disciplined yourself. Oh, you couldn't make it to work. You didn't have enough gumps. You were a little tired on Wednesday morning. You didn't go. You get that check. Oh, man, I'm going to go pay my rent. Discipline is freedom. If you'll hit the gym on time every day, I'm pretty soon you're going to find out you walk, you're feeling better. Why? Because discipline rewards you with freedom. I know that sounds crazy, but you look at those people that excel and do great things. It's because they maintain a serious discipline on that subject or in that arena. And now they can do anything they want because they were 
Discipline is the doorway to freedom. That's why he calls his people disciples because real freedom comes from Jesus. When you're a disciple, you're disciplined. He that the Son has set free is free indeed. Oh. It's the things, certain things are hard for a reason. I want to get up there and do like so-and-so. Then you better have the discipline to pray like so-and-so. You better have the discipline to, 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 to study and read and, and, and get. She says, well, I'm not called to do that. What do you mean you're not, you're not called to be great for God? Oh, uh, he said, okay, well, I'm going to call you. I just want you to be mediocre. I'm going to call you, but I only want you to show up when it feels good. I'm going to call you, but I just want you to sing fair. Listen, if, they, if, 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 if doing something great were easy, everybody would be doing it. And Jesus said, you know what? If you come and follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Humility is invincible. Humility is invincible because it opens the door to improvement. Proud people can't be taught anything. Arrogant people can't be helped. They can't improve because they're arrogant, and arrogant is another form of stagnation. Jesus' first invitation was clear. It was intentional. I'm going to take you and change you and mold you and shape you. Matthew 4, 19, the very first time he said, follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. He said it loud. He, he, he said, I'll make you men. I'm going to make you stand out in the crowd. I'm going to make you, you're going to swim counter culture. You're going to be fishers of men. You used to be fishers of finances, but I'm going to now make you fishers of something way more important, instead of going with the flow of the world, instead of running the race of the rats that everyone else is running, we're going to go against the time. We're going to go a different direction. We're not going to be people caught up in the thing. We're not going to be drug addicts and dependents. We're not going to be, we're not going to be the problem children. We're not going to be, we're going to stand up and be, challenged. man, look at that. That's different. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12 and 1, and it's right here. We're first seeing we also are compassed about with so great a lot of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, from fishers of finance to fishers of men, from fornicators to lovers of God, from addicts to anointing. The message is the same today. And he saith unto them, follow me, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I, I'm going to make you so important to humanity. I, I, you're going to be my hands. You're going to be my feet. You're going you're to be me walking among men. I'm going to make you fishers of men. When Jesus takes the wheel of your life, uh, he turns the direction of your life. He proved it in the lives of ordinary men. You need, it's okay to be ordinary. There was nothing extraordinary. They all would have died unheralded, unknown, and unrecorded. Their time on earth would have been swept away like the sands of time. There would be no record of their deeds. But you know what happened? They met Jesus. Everything would have just been there, except they met Jesus. Let me say that again. Except. They met Jesus, and they did something with that meeting. They did something with that intersection of meeting, something that separates people to this very day, just like it did back then. What will you do when you meet Jesus today? What will happen to you when you meet Jesus today? They met Jesus and they followed him. Uh, that one decision changed their life and the lives of everyone around them. It changed everything about their lives. And because they didn't just meet Jesus, they followed him. It changed their lives. And by extension, because when they met him back then, and it changed their lives, it changes everything about our lives. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. It changed all eternity. They did not 
lose their, listen, I want you to get this. They didn't lose their uniqueness. When they all fell in line behind to follow Jesus, they didn't lose their uniqueness. They, they didn't lose who they were. They were not marginalized and homogenized into a clone. They were 12 individuals who maintained their own particular idiosyncrasies. Their pasts were not changed, but their futures were. They were not perfect after having been with Jesus even for three years. They were living examples of how Jesus joins a life and never pirates the life vessel. Mm. Jesus joins our life when he is wanted. Yes, yes, invited. Yes. He stands at the door and knocks yes. right now. Yes, Will you honestly let him in? The, these men wanted Jesus in their life. And Jesus took them as they were. And worked with all they were. Worts and all. He began a good work in each of them. Each of them, in their own moment of decision, decided to follow and obey Jesus. Each of them could have become obscure and left the group. Eventually one did. One decision changed their life forever. One decision, just a simple decision that is set before everyone. The genesis of that decision did not reveal where it would eventually lead. The next few years of their life would present countless moments of conflict, rejection, uncertainty, fear, but ultimately a reward. Hmm. The choice was the envy of angels and the disdain of demons. Jesus is still enlisting disciples for his kingdom today. I know you've been around a while. You may have been to church a few times. You may, you may be a stalwart member. But if you'll meet Jesus today, a lot of things can change. Amen. Amen. He, 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 he's not asked you to change your occupation as a rule. He, he's not asked you to change your personality and become a stamped image of Christianity. He, all Jesus ever asked of any potential follower is to follow. Look at your past and look to your future in my hand. Uh, your liabilities are never his limitations. Uh, when you become, will never be based on who you've been. That's what the decision to follow Jesus does. I wonder if you're willing to give Jesus your mess, you'll allow him to turn it into a message. Because that's the story of his disciples, of the apostles. That's the story of all those from that time to right now. It's simple. Well, what happened to you, Pastor? I met Jesus. What pulled you out of that? Where did you get the ability? I didn't. I met Jesus. Well, 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 where, where do you come off with that? I, I, I'm just telling you, all I did was meet Jesus. Amen. I, I can't tell you I really did anything. I, I just I followed him. I, I don't have the corner on the mark. I, I've not found some, some secret oracle. Or I, I just met Jesus. That's right. That's right. And I let him talk to me, and I let him walk with me, and I, I let him to come in, and I submitted myself, and I said, you know, not my will, but thy will be done many times, countless times. And still not enough times I've said, not my will, but thy will be done. That's really all that got me here. That's really all that created a prayer life or a study life. A Bible. That's all that created my Christianity. The voice you listen to will determine the life and the future you live. If you pay attention to Scripture, 
Jesus paid attention to people. Mm. If you're going to be like Jesus, you'll pay attention to people. And if you're not, you're going to pay attention to every habit and hobby that comes along. On the way to Nain, he turned a weeping widow into a miracle-believing mother. Near Jericho, he stopped and healed a blind beggar. He, he took time out for children, time out for lepers. He took time out to talk to an adulterous woman and saved her life. He took time for a hated tax collector. He took time for a, a centurion. He, he, he took time. Jesus paid attention to people. He's still doing that. He's paying attention to you right now. He sees you. You're not just some face in the crowd. You have an intimate relationship with a God who's vying for your attention. He stands at the door and he knocks. If you're willing to meet Jesus today, open the door. To, he will change your life. He intentionally stopped by a well to meet a lady of ill repute. To speak to an outcast because he was willing to speak to her and the entire city was reached. He took an extraordinary moment for Thomas. He took the time to reach down into the dirt in the garden and put Malchus's ear back on. I wonder how many of us today right now could use Jesus to reach in and intimately know what you need. Will you meet Jesus this morning? Will you meet Jesus this morning? Will you allow him to make you a believer and a follower? Let's stand. Jesus paid attention to people. The truck had run off the road and crashed to a tree with enormous impact. It was hit with such force the engine was forced back into the cab and the driver's body was twisted under the roof. The feet of the driver were caught between the clutch and the brake pedals. The doors were crushed and bent out of shape. Wreckers arrived and were called in with supreme effort made. Every attempt to open the cab to free the driver. However, the wreckage was so bad that despite their best efforts of even skilled men, they could not attach hooks to the doors or roof. And the record could not be used. To make matters worse, a fire began in the cab. Concern turned to panic because it was obvious that before the fire trucks could arrive, this driver was going to be burned to death. Onlookers stepped back in horror, looked on the situation as hopeless. And a quiet figure stepped to the front. A man later to be known as Charles Dennis Jones stepped forward to decide what, if he could do anything. He stepped in, reached in, embraced himself against the door, and started to pull. Slowly, grudgingly, the door began to give way. The force and effort that Jones put forth was so great. The blood pumping so hard that the muscles in his arm expanded until they literally burst the sleeves of his shirt. Finally, the door came open and Jones reached inside barehandedly, bent the brake pedal and the clutch pedals out of the way, freed the man's legs reached over and put that fire out with his bare hands. He then proceeded to crawl inside the cab with that injured driver. 
bracing himself in a crouching position with his feet on the floor and his back against the top of the cab. He lifted the roof by his enormous strength. This freed the driver. The spectators were able to pull him to safety. As everybody stood around to check on the injured driver, they looked around and Charles Dennis Jones was nowhere to be found. Everybody intrigued by this person that stepped in when nobody else could do anything caused a nationwide manhunt. A local garage started putting things together and wait a minute, I had sent Charles over in that area. So we got a picture of Charles out of one of the photos from the employees and showed it to the authorities. It said, that's him! And so they, they found Charles and they said, hey, what compelled you to step forward in a situation that could have cost you your life and to even try to do things that multiple men couldn't do. His reply was a simple one. I hate fire. I hate fire. Well, okay. The story goes on about the reason why <clears throat> Charles Dennis Jones hated fire. The story was told that only 18 months earlier, he was forced to stand by as his house burned down. and hear his small daughter burn to death. What would happen to the apostolic church if we hated sin like he hated fire? What would happen around here if we started believing and living and realizing, you know what? I hate what sin does to people. I hate what it does. I, I haven't been called to come sit on a cushy pew or to preach flowery sermons. We've been called to step in and start pulling the wreckage of people's lives apart to set them free. Is there anyone here today that wants to meet Jesus on those terms? Set me loose to help set captives free. Set me loose. Don't give me a ministry. Give me a message. Give me a burden. Oh, except they meet Jesus.